Welcome back for part two of the Brittany Murphy saga. If you haven't seen part one, I highly suggest you do so first. You can find the link in the description. We're going to dive deeper into the golden years of Brittany's career and the slow but obvious decline after Simon entered her life. I think it's important to highlight the heights of her potential so we can better understand the entire timeline leading up to her demise and what may have been causing her sanity and health to be slowly chipped away. Next was Eminem's autobiographical film, 8 Mile, also released in 2002, with Eminem in the lead, co-starring Mackay Pfeiffer, Taron Manning, and Kim Basinger. That could be the other. That. Yeah, that's what I said. My name's Alex. <laughs> hey. Hey. Oh, the guy you was looking for. So, I hear you're a real dope rapper. A dope rapper? Yeah. Dope draws awesome. a dope rapper. Yeah, it's around. And again, when she starred opposite oh. Ashton Kutcher, for the rom-com Just Married, as a risque newlywed. I think I'm moving back. Absolutely incredible. Uh, let's go. Now? Let's go, let's go, oh. let's go. What are you saying? Oh, oh. Uh. Ready? And camera. And action. I was always a little creeped out by this whole camping thing. I like this. It was fun. <laughs> I told you, you like it. <laughs> Brittany was rumored to have dated Eminem during filming and had a very highly publicized relationship with Ashton, which had also developed on set. Now, with more of what's been coming out about his past behavior behind the scenes of that 70s show and his association with and defense of the now-jailed serial offender, Danny Masterson, it raises a lot more questions. There's still a lot of foundational ground to cover, though, so we'll be more closely analyzing her past relationships and her potentially toxic family dynamics in Part 3. So stay tuned for that. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the little bell so you don't miss out. Everyone has their own taste in film, so I guess it just depends on what you're into. But these are some of my favorites. Okay. Oh, The Shining we have. Shrek! Shrek is incredible! This is the best movie I saw all last year. I think everybody's seen it by now about 500 times, but this is some funny stuff. I think I'm gonna rent this too. I'm getting a little bit greedy. I, I'm sorry, MTV, but thank you. She then flipped the scripts and warmed our hearts as the sweet and lovable nanny in Uptown Girls Spots. And you don't know how to dry without destroying the environment. For every single roll of paper towels that you waste, a tree in the rainforest dies. And I'm gonna die of botulism from the germs of that gunky towel, you tree-loving hippie. At least I don't prefer tofu to normal hamburgers, my little friend. And I'm not the one who's gonna get mad cow disease and go nuts. Though you don't seem to have a brain to fry in the first place. Oh, maybe not. But at least I'm not the one holding the gunky germ-infested towel. <laughs> And then again as the producer of a daytime talk show in the rom-com Little Black Book, released in 2004. Smart, Diane Sawyer. Chic, smart, intelligent. And she married well. Good point. She's a little beige. No, 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 she's taupe. Taupe is never beige. Taupe's classic, confident. It says, I'm elegant and I don't need color to prove it. There you go. Oh, I want to work with her one day. She's about eight years old. Her father just left and her mom, um, you know, is teaching her and at a very young age to avoid chaos at all costs. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Stacy gets this job at this show that's basically, you know, Kippy Can I see as this fallen Oprah. Welcome to Kippy Can Do. Today we're putting the dogs to the ultimate test. Is your man a cheating bastard? No! Stacy does start working there as an AP, so an, as an associate producer, but very low in the totem pole. 
Stacy's boyfriend is away. He's a scout for the New Jersey Devils, and he's away scouting for his hockey team. Her final major film role was in the neo-noir crime anthology film called Sin City, released in 2005. I was wondering if you could help me looking for somebody. Cold night like this, everybody's looking for somebody stranger. Shelly sort of links together all three stories. She's, uh, she's a waitress at the local watering hole. She's scared out of her mind, but um, trying at the same time to be an independent woman. Keep your hands to yourself or I'll cut your little back off. It's not like that. My name is Nancy. As to the stage, Pilgrim. She's just a woman. stuff there it was all there the first time we see Brittany she's in a man's shirt and she, she is drawn basically nude but I had a lot of options a lot of different ways that we could do that I'd still have the man's shirt on without without her being nude underneath because it's a very sheer shirt so Shelly basically wore these massive ass-kicking shoes I mean these spikes could kill anybody <laughs> they were they were pretty priceless um, with an ensemble cast including Bruce Willis, Jessica Alba, Elijah Wood, Mickey Rourke. Benicio Del Toro and Clive Owen. The kind of total jerk loser who has to beat up on a girl to make himself feel like a man. Because we're shooting green screen is to shoot very fast. Excuse me, miss. I was wondering if you could help me. I'm looking for somebody. After that, they all get in the swing of things. Someone like Brittany Murphy was there for only one day, even though she's in all three stories. For instance, she never met Bruce Willis. Our uh, first guest is a uh, lovely actress starring in a uh, new film entitled Sin City. Ooh. <laughs> Exciting. Ooh, yes. Yeah. It opens on Friday. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Brittany Murphy. <laughs> You can see how with playing some of these roles so convincingly, it was very easy for people to assume drugs meant heavy narcotics. Not to mention that she'd begun losing an unnatural amount of weight going into the mid-2000s. You're gonna have to call back later. Much, much later. Later. Who is it? Uh, just me, Spider. Hey, go away, fat boy. In spite of all the negative publicity, she wrote her claim to fame to its peak during this time and ran the entire circuit aimed towards a teen demographic. Riding in cars with boys can be a dangerous thing for teenage girls. Yes, most definitely, especially if you're riding with the boys our characters are riding with in this film. But we were girls that, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Our next guest uh, stars in a current film, Don't Say a Word, and a new motion picture entitled Riding in Cars with Boys. That, uh, that one, that one, hey, that one opens tomorrow. Here's the lovely Brittany Murphy, everybody. You Hi, look everybody. great. You look, fa you look fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm in the greatest city in the world. That's right. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Hang out with Eric Blair. Oh, how are you, Blair. Eric Blair? <laughs> Blair out any day. <laughs> it's fabulous. Yeah. Um, I just saw you in that Drew Barrymore movie. Me and my girlfriend watched it. It was awesome. I'm so happy you liked it. You were great. Isn't it? I'm a yeah. huge Drew fan and a huge Penny Marshall fan. I bet you are. Will you be working with Drew in the future, you think? I certainly hope so. I, I'm not quitting anytime soon, and I don't think she is. So I, I, there's long lives ahead of us, and um, I, I had the grandest time working with her. 
does your career, when you look at, at you know your career, does it ever amaze you? Like, wow, I've come so far. It, it's so strange when you're when you're working all the time. You don't really think of things like that. But I, I get very excited a lot. <laughs> of course, there's epiphanies and beautiful moments where, in the middle of growing, or just moments. I just appreciate anything basically that I'm able to do, and I kind of can't believe that I'm that I'm that I'm able to do this. <laughs> it makes me cry if I talk about it long all enough. Right, all right, don't we don't want you to cry. We want, we want you to be happy. I recommend it for anyone young to get a broken heart because it's horrible and horrific and awful and disgusting and hurtful as it is at the time, it'll make you stronger. How long did it take you to perfect the pouring the beer between your legs? How long did that take? Only a few minutes, really. really? It's, it's easy, you could do it, trust me. <laughs> What's the key? The art of illusion. The key is uh, sort of a heels, proper uh... heels and, and, and strong calves. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Good evening to you, Miss Murphy. Oh, and to you, kind Sarkatis. A curious dream haunts me, milady. Just last eve, an uneasy sleep fell upon me, wherein I imagined a strange and wondrous world where Emo sits down at a banquet table alongside hip-hop Rock, soul, and more. Pray tell, dear sir, tell me more. I love, I love what I do very much. I think he's so blessed to be able to be doing it. And, uh, I, was, I was initiated to member of the Academy this year, which is pretty exciting. So that's enough for me right now. That's where that was enough. But Jack, everybody's insecure. She's right, Jack. What? Who said that? Andy Garcia? You know, Jack, I know of another actor who's very insecure sometimes. You mean? No, Brittany Murphy. Everyone's got insecurities. Everyone gets the blues. But if you can't take it from Andy and me, take it from Mr. Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise didn't want to sing. I guess. He was kind of scared. So come on, Jack, gather up your nuts, you son of a bitch! You can find the confidence if you look deep inside. Just listen up to us movie stars. We will never lie. The winner is... Oh, let me see that. Uh, I'll never tell. Hi, Brittany. I'm Tamara from Women's Hair Daily. Nice to Brittany, meet how you. How are you? Good. Good what you. brings you out tonight? I'm here to see a picture. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Oh, I can't wait to see it. I heard there's spitting plates and fabulous things and children, and I can't wait to be. A, I, I can't wait to see it and do the show. And what's what's your idea of glamour? What makes you feel beautiful? Oh, in the inside, quite obviously, um, doesn't have anything to do with. Uh, sometimes looking into the eyes of a loved one. Sometimes dancing. Sometimes dancing around your bathroom, you know, with the music blasting and. That's beautiful to me. Well, this is one of the coolest awards on the show. Choice Hissy Fit. Yes. And the big hello, you guys. And hi. <laughs> so this is Choice Hissy Fit. And throwing a hissy fit is not a suitable solution or a situation to any problem. And it could get you grounded by your parents. Dakota just mentioned how much she loved working with you and that you are instant friends and the chemistry between you two is unbelievable. I met my, I was able to work with my, I mean I call her my kindred soul sister. She treats everybody the same way and you know she treats everybody so special and it makes everybody feel really good. Shake it, shake it, shake it, show them. shake it for a Golden Globe picture. And the Golden Globe goes to... Al Pacino, Angels in America. Thank you. I hope people can find the comedic <laughs> aspects. If you feel like laughing, even if it's at me, not with me, laugh.
I wanted to be the anti scream queen. Yeah, I think I think And it worked because it never came out. So. <laughs> Brittany Murphy and I have just reached your fabulous buildings. Um, take two. I'm so nervous. It's my first day of work. What the hell should I say? Please welcome three white chicks, Sean and Marlon Waynes, and from the Little Black Book, Brittany Murphy. Men, they had to dress up like white women for their new film that I can't wait to see called White Chicks. So I just, I'm curious, how, how was that? Well, other than a little bit of camel toe, <laughs> it was cool. We looked a lot like you. Yeah? Uh, yeah, actually, we was a spitting image, except we had a whole <laughs> lot more ass. <laughs> a whole lot more ass. <laughs> All right, well, if I dressed up as a black man, you know, I bet I'd have a much bigger, oh, you know. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, he had a nominee for best comedic performance. My first guest is, a, uh, of course, a lovely actress who's appeared in the films Uptown Girls, Just Married, and Eight Mile. Beginning this Friday, you can see her in Little Black Book. Please welcome Brittany Murphy. <laughs> That thing Thank with the butt you. at the what end, a... that was good. All right. <laughs> what a beautifully wonderful band. I've been dancing to you guys backstage. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That is not allowed here. <laughs> Sorry. That's very nice. No, no, that was, that was perfectly. Hi. Do I wear boxers or briefs? Um, I, I, I wear briefs myself. As far as a gentleman is concerned, I really don't mind either way. It, it's so long as they suit the human being and, and they feel confident within themselves. I'm so sorry for these asinine questions. It's all right. <laughs> Can oh I ask God. you a few? Oh my God. <laughs> Underwear questions. I'm here tonight to, to uh, well, well, Bob and Harvey Weinstein are helping Hello, are helping support uh, MFAR, which is a very, very important organization. Uh, we're raising money this you evening. Know. He's very working class compared to the to the uh, sirens in the film. Uh, so she, you know, she has cracks. You could see her, you could see her flaws, and I, and I think that's that's a very, very sweet about her. Yes, but I'm also a huge Will Ferrell fan, and I'm thrilled to see uh, Will Ferrell play the Ricky Bobby. Thank you for stopping. We're a huge Whitney Murphy fans. Have you fun yet? Have it be one last time yet? Have a beautiful evening, everybody. Thank you very much. What made you want to do it? Was it working with Karen? Was it the character? Or was it just the piece as a whole? And I, Karen asked me to play Krista. Um, and I, I, I then read the script. And I'm a huge fan of, of Blue Car and uh, a huge fan of Karen's work. So that was exciting in itself. I was, I was in, intrigued by what it would be. And I did not put it down. It was definitely a page turner upon reading it. Um, I, I, when reading a script, when, he, when, when the destiny, for me, I was just trying to figure out who's the killer. The journey was the destination. And I got wrapped up in all of the characters' lives, and they completely, I was enraptured by all of the characters, and that, that, that's a, that's a beautiful character piece, and so rare. Brittany really wanted to be a legendary movie star, not just a good actress. She wanted to make it big. She was probably not well equipped to deal with all these external forces. People described her as childlike, trusting, and naive. This would not be unusual. She was only 17 when she started working on the movie Clueless. In addition, she was cut off from some of the normal socialization opportunities because she was an actress. She had a tutor on set instead of having to go to school. She was primarily relating to other people who were older than her and more experienced. Is there anything out of the ordinary with her than the days or weeks or months prior to her death? Sharon, no. anything? No. She was, um, we had all had a little bit of a, a upper respiratory 
um, flu because we were traveling and she had at the least uh, she had a little bit of laryngitis of laryngitis yes that was the only thing and and she other than that she was you know perfectly healthy and well uh, if you die in pneumonia it's not accident uh, it, People don't die at home with the mom and the husband present of pneumonia or of anemia. The most significant feature that's been uh, indicated in the death certificate is the uh, uh, prescription drugs. And we don't know which ones are uh, involved or the amount in the blood until they're going to release that apparently in about two weeks. How could she die of pneumonia? It wasn't pneumonia. It was, a, it was drugs. It will, it, these cases are always drugs. And the people who are around right. her know exactly why it is. And yet the coroner calls it an accident, just like the coroner in Florida screwed up the prosecution of the, the Anna Nicole Smith crowd uh, until months later when the Attorney General of California finally got it together. Uh, that's, I think, what's happening here. Vanessa, this is Rhonda. How you doing? I was hoping that you could show Vanessa around the craft shop later. I can't. She got a lot skinnier. Uh, her face became more gaunt. There were a lot of, you know, accusations flying. You know, did she have an eating disorder? Was she using illegal substances? Earlier this month at a fashion event, Murphy appeared painfully thin, and there's speculation she may have been battling an eating disorder for years. And in fact, the, the interesting thing is clearly her size. She, I mean, she's underweight. It looks like an eating disorder of some type. And that happened so fast in 2005 that she had to publicly come out and, and announce that she was not using cocaine. The rumors were so widespread, she had to dismiss those rumors at the time. And then since then, um, when you talk to people in Hollywood, what you hear back is, we're surprised, but we aren't startled, meaning that there had been rumors for some time for the last two or three years that she had been seen out of it, spacey, a, a little disoriented. Which had been speculated by the media to be as a result of a cocaine addiction. In 2005, she personally disputed these claims, saying, just for the record, I have never even tried it in my entire life. Now to dig deeper. In April of 2007, Brittany married the self-proclaimed director and screenwriter, Simon Monjack in a private Jewish ceremony at her home that they shared in LA. This came as a surprise to many, as they had not announced their engagement and had scarcely made any public appearances in the very short time that they dated, which they say was around eight months. The marriage wasn't even formally revealed by the couple. It wasn't until they were spotted at the Kentucky Derby in early May of 2007, where it was noted that the pair both had new wedding rings, that the public became aware. Yes, I'm sorry. Does anyone have a question? Yeah. Oh, my fingernails aren't as pretty as. That's gorgeous. My husband has exquisite taste. <laughs> Thank you. We just celebrated our 10 month wedding anniversary last weekend. It's exciting. I love being married. Reports had then surfaced that he was facing deportation due to an expired visa only a few months prior. In February of 2007, he had in fact spent nine days in jail after being apprehended for overstaying his work visa. Overview, I want to talk now about 32-year-old actress Brittany Murphy, who died last month. Her controversial husband, the unemployed British screenwriter Simon Monjack, uh, is being portrayed as the villain in her death. He's being portrayed as a drunken bully living off a woman that he married because his visa had expired uh, and whose career that he helped ruin because of his obnoxious conduct. On top of his looming deportation, Simon had a series of broken engagements prior to Brittany. He also had a history of financial struggles that he had tried to remedy by suing the production company responsible for the biographical film Factory Girl, released in 2006. What do you think of the factory? Do you like it here? Of course. I think it's always good to get beyond your experiences, you know? And I hate it when people take themselves too seriously, don't you? He claimed that they had stolen his script but being that it was based on a real story, there were bound to be similarities in the script and scenes. I read somewhere that you were born in California, is that true? Yes, but we were from back east originally. Um, <clears throat> well, Fuzzy got sick, and so he wanted to move to a, to a warmer climate. And he bought a ranch in, in Santa Barbara, California, and, and that's where I was born. 
Ma and Jack was likely just upset that they had received funding to begin the production and had therefore beaten him to the punch. Eventually, they were forced to settle with Simon and give him writing credit. As they were unable to start production, so long as the proceedings were taking place and their hands were tied. He's my best girlfriend. <laughs> Who's your best boyfriend? Oh, that's easy. That would... Actually, it's not that easy. The director, George Hickenlooper, stated, He filed a frivolous lawsuit against us, making bogus claims that we had stolen his script. He held us literally hostage, and we were forced to settle with him as he held our production over a barrel. This earned him the moniker of Conjack, among various circles of screenwriters, producers, directors, and the like within the industry. When Monchak and Britney's mother Sharon Murphy appeared on the Today Show last month, he denied reports that the star of Clueless and Eight Mile was just another in the melancholy Hollywood tradition of drug abuse. But while the L.A. coroner is labeling her death accidental, the coroner confirms that it was caused by pneumonia, anemia, and most importantly, by multiple prescription drug intoxication. The coroner goes on to say that Britney's death was preventable if only she had seen a doctor in the last days and weeks of her life. Because of the rumors, because if she changed her team, Hollywood is a village. And once you upset the villagers, they talk and they gossip and they rumor and they have blood on their hands. And I hope they wash them with very hot water because the way they treated Brittany Murphy when she was alive was terrible. But who exactly has blood on his hands? Just two weeks before she died, Brittany was fired by Warner Brothers from performing in the sequel to the animated hit movie Happy Feet. For a time, Monchek blamed the studio for the star's death and threatened to sue. Simon, can you tell me about the, the suit you're bringing against Warner Brothers? It's just uh, what it is. So, uh, there's nothing really more to add to what I've said already. So I hope uh, you know, that he really gets the justice that she deserves. If he's looking for justice, perhaps Montjack should look in the mirror. Because now that it's clear drugs played a role in her death, Monchak's lawsuit is probably a non-starter. Add to that the fact that she was actually fired from two films because of alleged bizarre behavior. A month before she was fired by Warner Brothers, Britney was also fired from a feature film named The Caller, whose producers blame Monchak's misbehavior. On the set to do his wife's hair and makeup, Monchak allegedly terrorized the film crew with drunken demands and threats, which he denies. Craig spoke with prominent UCLA professor Habib Sadiqi, who commented that along with Britney's broken heart, her recent painful plastic surgery might have contributed to her drug use and death. If you would imagine a young woman, a young actress with incredible uh, uh, talent, um, you can't breathe, you have pneumonia, you're anemic, uh, you have this chronic pain, right? And you're taking cough syrups and all these medications which could lead into uh, constipation, not being able to use the restroom. And that could lead you to be nauseous uh, uh, and, and, and vomiting. Every story needs a villain, Montjack said after his wife's tragic death, concluding, and everyone decided it is me. And on that point, ladies and gentlemen, I agree with him. He had intended to direct a film about Sigmund Freud based on the novel called The White Hotel, written by D.M. Thomas, which is how he lured Murphy in, offering her the lead role, but this of course never came to fruition. I love the vibrant color of it and I thought it was really fresh and, and delightful and still sexy, there's a bustier and I, I loved it. And what I'm guessing was meant to be like a romantic sentiment, Simon has stated that he had fallen in love with Murphy while photographing her as a teen, and claimed that he patiently waited while the two passed through relationships not meant for them, casting complete ignorance to his abysmally failed marriage and engagements. Now, how did she meet? How did you come into the picture, Simon? When did you meet? I met Brittany when she was, and Sharon when Brittany was 17. So, and we kept in touch for all of the years. As uh, how'd you meet her? I took a photograph. You were a so, photographer? Yeah, part-time. It's a hobby. Oh. Um, and, uh, it, you know, we, we, we just became friends and... Uh, it was friendly. 
It was friendly for years, yeah. I mean, you know, I visited on sets and see Sharon, and, and, and you know, it was, it was very... She was infectious, an infectious angel. The romance was later. The romance was later. Brittany stated, We first met when I was 17 years old. We checked in with each other throughout the years and remained friends. The easiest decision I ever had in my life was getting married. He's flown around the world to make sure we spend every single night together. In 2005, warrants were issued for his arrest in Virginia on charges of credit card fraud and theft allegations, but the charges were later dropped. In 2006, he was sued by a mortgage firm, Coots & Co., and was ordered to pay $470,000. Records also show that between 1997 and 2006, he was evicted from at least four different homes that the authorities are aware of. He was sued in 2007 by ex-wife Simone Bien for an unpaid settlement that had resulted from their divorce. Their infrequent public appearances, even after the wedding, and the way Simon took over management of Brittany and her finances left even more questions unanswered following her passing. She had apparently fired all of her people, her agent, lawyers, manager, the entire team, and they were all replaced by Simon. No one could even contact her without going through him. She didn't even have her own cell phone or control over social media or emails. He had control over everything. Just Very one. classy, Just Brittany. One. <laughs> one each, that would Just be one awesome. Okay. Like <laughs> Brittany, there's a little kid back here that can't nope. reach over all these people. They're all move out of sight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brittany. Of course, you guys. This is your program, by the way. <laughs> he came back out with the photos. Oh, this is Brittany's. Oh, no problem. Oh, sorry. That's all right. That's all right. There you thank go. you, Brittany. I appreciate you signing. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, Brittany. Hey guys, that's one, guys. That's it. All right. That's it. Mike, pull out if you're done. Yeah, yeah. I'm full out. Yeah. All right, so he. Uh, Brittany, you. this lady didn't get one back here. Yeah, it's a girl. So There's a kid and a girl in the back. Right okay. Yes, yes of course. It's for my son. No problem. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Tom's name. His What's your name? John. 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 Thank you, Brittany. Of course, no problem. I'll take the pen whenever she's done. Okay, J-O-H-N or J-O-N? Huh? I'm sorry? J-O-H-N or J-O-N? J-O-H-N. Okay. Oh, okay. A group of her friends and ex-staff had tried to intervene and began showing Brittany all of this evidence of his financial struggles and legal problems, the fact that he had been facing deportation, and all the other gory details. In spite of all of that, both Brittany and Sharon chose to side with Simon. I couldn't believe that this bottom-feeding sociopath had actually worked his way up the food chain to someone who was actually a legitimate artist. So the first thing I did was I called her agency. I said, you need to tell her every word out of his mouth is a lie and that she's got to get the hell out. The word coming back was her manager had tried and gotten fired as a result. This is all starting to come out. Her true friends know that Simon's not good news. There was this talk of an intervention. And this intervention took place at Brittany's house. These friends were showing Brittany and her mother documentation that you know Simon had trouble with the law that Simon had outstayed his visa which he had Brittany and her mom said no we love Simon and we believe Simon sorry and that intervention failed just before she had passed she had been fired from what would have been one of her final films called The Caller which started shooting in 2009 a supernatural horror film that was eventually released in 2011 the production representative claims that Simon had shown up on the set sloppy drunk and had disrupted filming, which led to her dismissal. About a month ago, she was fired from a movie she was working on. Her reps say it was uh, uh, creative differences, but uh, reports indicate that she was, uh, according to the producer or director, problematic on the set, that her husband was on the set constantly, and he was a problem. The month before Brittany died, they had gone to Puerto Rico to film a movie called The Caller. When they got there, I guess she was only on set for a day before she left the movie. Now, the movie initially said that they had asked her to leave the project because Simon showed up and he was drunk on set and she defended him when they tried to make Simon leave. Simon just had his lawyers contact the people who were doing The Caller and say that they had to retract that statement and say that it was a mutual parting. 
Director Gordon claims that he was told that the team wanted Simon removed from the set because of his behavior, but Brittany rushed to his defense. And that's when she was let go, not only because of his behavior alone. We know that she was let go on a movie in 2008. She was let go on a movie just in November in 2009. Nobody gets fired in Hollywood, yeah. but she was dismissed for problems, and she certainly did have a troubled marriage with her current husband, Simon Monjak. Well, and there have been rumors plaguing her for years about drug use and anorexia. Now, it, it, whether or not they're accurate, they're, they're relevant because they did affect her career. And, and I talked to a producer who had hired her for a movie she was to be working on in just a couple of weeks, and he almost fired her because of those rumors. She called him him personally and based on that conversation he kept her on the movie which is now up in the air but uh, but you know she she had developed a reputation and she was trying very hard to regain her career but she had been called by some producers a space cadet because she seemed spacey whether she was anorexic I don't know but theoretically the toxic reports will show something what they're going to be looking for is to see whether there were drugs in her body that might have caused the death or whether she had some type of genetic abnormality that just caused her to die at 32, which would be unusual, but does occasionally happen. It just seems so shocking for a 32-year-old to die of uh, what appears to be a massive heart attack. Is there more to this story? There have been so, many, so much speculation, so many rumors of drug abuse and eating disorder. The, uh, yeah, one of the things I tried to do, as a matter of fact, last night, once I heard about the death, was call up people in Los Angeles and try to separate exactly what you said, the, the gossip and the rumor from the facts. And yeah. what I was surprised about was that although she had, at least to me and I think a lot of other people that knew her casually, a clean girl image, she didn't have a bad girl image, um, a, a number of people, a makeup artist that had worked with her on a, at least one film, including a studio executive who knew her, said that for a period of time that she had appeared at public events seeming out of it, um, there, they certainly talked about cocaine and heroin use at different times that they thought she was on, although they didn't see her use it uh, uh, regularly. They didn't see her use it at all, but they had seen her with this great weight loss. They had seen her even in one case, the makeup artist said what she viewed as nodding out at two different times, and this was just within the past year. Among the directors and producers, Simon was already considered a con man. But now they began worrying, since he had tied himself to poor Britney, saying that he was a dangerous guy, acting as if he had a lot of money when he was actually in serious debt and using her money to enrich himself and improve his image, not to mention keeping his residency in the U.S. You just had I think instead of Simon Mindjack, her husband, suing Warner Brothers for firing Brittany Murphy for alleged bizarre behavior, I think that uh, the Sharon Murphy, the mother of Brittany Murphy, should think about suing Simon Mindjack uh, for aiding and abetting uh, the decline and fall of a, of a young actress who was brilliant and should have had her career thriving at the age of 32 rather than being someone who acts up on sets and gets fired from movies. And uh, I think at some point we'll take a closer look at him. Listen to this. It's one of her last interviews on December 1st at the premiere of her latest movie. Why did June, do you think June ultimately cheated? By the way, Phantom of the Opera was filmed in the in, in the exact same yeah. uh, studio, which is no longer there. It was the oldest on the Universal lot. I heard and this was the last production. Lost in the fire. Very sad. It was so beautiful, my goodness. And that ambience, of course, fed yeah. into a film such as this. Um, I'm sorry, what were you, at? you were asking me about June. Yeah, why do you think she ultimately cheated? Um, I, I, I don't know June's actual reasons for cheating. I, I'm very different from June. Yeah. <laughs> very, very different. And really quick, last question. Is it easier, do you find it easier to film comedies or thrillers? What comes more naturally to you? Oh, Lord. You know, it, for me, I, I've had the good fortune of being able to uh, play characters that are stuck in the middle of comedic situations, comedic stories, ridiculous, you do it all. Or, or, or tragic. And um, I, I, it all has to do with the story and the director. And that, that, that's really where the decisions are, are made on my behalf. Simon was born and grew up in Southeast England. His father had passed on when he was 16 as a result of a brain tumor. As he was growing up, Simon was the most incredible guy. He had an IQ off the scale. He was able to charm anyone, old ladies, mothers. He would turn his charm on anyone. 
from early childhood, Simon had that ability to manipulate the environment to, to get what he wanted out of it. Simon was 16 when his father died. It was a terrible, terrible shock. He never was the same again. He was still witty and full of life and funny, but something died in him. And I think he became more and more unreal. He was raised by his mother, Linda Monjack, who I must mention was a hypnotherapist and psychologist. This is most fascinating to me and brushed past in other video analysis and documentaries about this mysterious death. I learned that this is Simon Monjack. He said his grandfather founded British Steel, something like that, and he's worth a billion dollars. Since I'd never met a billionaire before, and I'm a very curious person, I decided to host a dinner. So Simon kind of held forth, and he kind of controlled the table. And he told us a lot of things about himself that night. He said that he was the largest collector of Vermeer, the great Dutch painter. He had more Vermeers than anyone else in the world. He had dated Elle McPherson and Madonna. He said that he had been dying from terminal brain cancer and that he had bought an experimental treatment derived from the fins of sharks and that it had saved his life. He said that he had a collection of Ferraris, 17 in all. You know, we laughed and we had a good time and, you know, I wondered if he'd ever finance one of the movies I wanted to make and that was it. Apparently, Simon had always had big dreams of becoming a Hollywood screenwriter and director, but his first and only attempt was a complete failure. The film was called Two Days at Nine Lives, released in 1999. He made grandiose claims that it received some of the best reviews of any independent film of all time. But this was a bold-faced lie. The only hint that anything was askew was that Simon had told me his movie was getting the best reviews in the history of independent film in England. My friend in London went to see the movie and he came back and he said, this is pretty terrible. Basically, it was a film about nine people over a two-day span in a rehab facility. How original and creative, I know. So that was kind of shocking. Time goes by, I get an email from his girlfriend, and I find out that every single word out of his mouth was a lie. I don't wish to discuss that it bearded interloper. <laughs> I love what you do with your cards there. Yeah, I like to throw them away. It's uh, a pleasure. Uh, yeah, it is. It's one of the few pleasures I have left. No, oh, I'm sorry. I know. But it's liberating, isn't it? Sometimes. <laughs> when 40-year-old Simon was found dead May 23rd, 2010, with similar causes to Britney's death only five months later, and good morning to you, Matt. Well, Simon Monjack, uh, he was found dead overnight, and he's worn many hats in his life. He was a screenwriter, a photographer, but he was best known as a grieving husband after the tragic loss of his beloved wife last December. The media and tabloids exploded with theories and speculation about what had now become a total mystery. And now tragedy has struck their Hollywood Hills home once again as the LAPD responded to a 911 call for medical aid. This time, Monjack was pronounced dead. An all too similar scene to that tragic December morning when paramedics responded to a 911 call for Brittany Murphy. Uh, this evening, uh, Mr. Monjack was uh, found unresponsive. Paramedics uh, responded to the house. He was pronounced at uh, 2145 hours. His death is under investigation by the Los Angeles County Department of Coroner with the assistance of LAPD. Uh, it appears to be a natural. There were some prescription drugs found that were belonged to Mr. Monjack and we'll have an ongoing investigation. Uh, cause of death is pending. There'll be an autopsy probably in the next day or so and uh, Pending toxicology, we'll be uh, releasing the results after we get those all those tests back. One of the ways that Simon legitimized those lies was by bringing a lovely girl into the equation. That was the cloak, and it was perfect because she believed the lies too. So he lived off this girl that had worked her heart out for every penny she had. And when her money ran out, he was gone. And very quickly, he became engaged to one of her friends. I can't stress enough how convincing this man was. 
After his computer was investigated, mysterious payments were found to have been sent to lawyers and other sources in Europe. It turned out that he had two secret children with two different women, and it was presumed that the largest lump sum payment of 48000 was likely payment for a child support settlement. And what, what do we find out later? We find out that he had a child that Bernie didn't know about, that none of us knew about he had a child. He was putting that child through private school in England. So I'm sure quite a bit of money of Britney's went to the child. The interesting thing about Simon's personal life is how little I think Britney really knew about it. When he died, it started coming out. So he had a daughter in England. By then, she was a teenager. But what people didn't know was that through my reporting, I would gotten in touch with a woman who lived in France, and she'd had a son with him. He had a child that nobody was talking about and nobody really knew about. Did you know there was a second mm -hmm. child? Excuse me? There's a second child. I didn't know that. I only know about one child. It was the second child. Wow. Simon had pilfered nearly $3 million over the course of three years, producing fake deeds and bonds, purchasing fake jewelry, all as investments. But in reality, he was just draining her financially. Less than a week after Simon passes away, Sharon calls me up to the house, and she brings out this jewelry. Diamond rings, bracelets, necklaces. And she says, I need cash. So I want you to take this and sell it. I said, I, I represent two jewelry designers on Rodeo Drive. And so I took everything, and I went to the first jewelry designer client, and I said, well, what's it worth? And he just took the thing out of his eye, and he said, none of it's real. And I start realizing, oh my gosh, he has lied to Sharon. She's going to be devastated. She thinks she's got a million dollars just in one piece. So I get back to the house, and she looked at me like, what is it? Why is this jewelry here? So I just have to tell you, none of it's real. And her face, she didn't have to say anything because her face said it all. She said, well, I guess there's no property either then. I guess there's no stocks and bonds, and I guess there's no real estate. Sharon thinks she's got financial security. She has nothing. All she's left with is the house, Brittany's pension, and whatever was in the bank. She was devastated. She was devastated. He had also been draining her physically and mentally, with the strain he put on her ability to work, the struggle with body image she had, and that he seemed to encourage. In the year 2000, in Interview Magazine, you know, a very important person in Hollywood said I wasn't f***able enough. He said I was huggable, but not f***able. So I got these extensions put in my hair, and that made a big difference. Yeah, welcome to Hollywood. This comment came back. She was cute, but she wasn't f***able. And she didn't get this part. And shortly after that, I saw her at a premiere. And she had lost an inordinate amount of weight. And she was dressing totally differently. I, I, I don't feel any sort of weight Hollywood pressure thing that's not a part of my life at all. But I do, um, I sympathize with anyone that has any kind of, um, any kind of a problem with their aesthetics. Because it's a, it, you know, that would be awful. I've been very fortunate to be raised in a family that embraces bodies and, and women and made us all feel confident about who we are. And I love food. <laughs> it was alarming to see how thin she had gotten, emaciated. She was so frail. When I saw Brittany Murphy getting really thin, I knew that he had something to do with that. He loved anorexic women. He would look at me from behind in my jeans, and he would go, do you really think you need to wear those jeans? Because, you know, you look Kinda. All right, remember Brittany Murphy? She was adorable as the slightly pudgy, tragically unhip 15-year-old in the movie Clueless. That was 15 years ago, back in 1995. Brittany Murphy's sudden death on Sunday was a stunner. She was 32 years old, no longer pudgy. In fact, she was rail thin. The mother of one of Monjack's children, Elizabeth Ragsdale, claimed that she was denied health care when she had fallen ill during her pregnancy that may have also had lethal consequences if her friend had not intervened. I was really sick in Monaco in the beginning of the pregnancy. It was just severe nausea where I couldn't raise my head. So I wanted to fly my sister and everybody over. No, 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 no. I, want, I don't want any people around running. Then my friend, who she's not the type to take no for an answer, and she was also very worried about me because I'd been cut off from everybody. And she showed up at the villa, and she said, you know, you look like you've just come out of a concentration camp. And she tells Simon, if you do not get her to a doctor, 
then I'm taking her now. And he said, I will. But I believe that my friend saved my life. I think she had not a great track record with men who cared about her. And she was a romantic. She really wanted to find a guy who loved her. And I really wonder if she thought she had found that in Simon. Personally, I hope she had. So she had that piece. I think it's crystal clear Simon was interested in Simon, not in Brittany. She wanted to marry him, and I said, honey, it's not been long enough. I think we were all sort of saying the same thing, except for Sharon. I think Sharon was for the marriage. Sharon raised Brittany as a single mom, and Simon became the man of the house. Sharon and Brittany had blind faith. If Simon said, we have to do this, there was no question. They did it. Her father left when she was quite young, and there was definitely an issue there. She was in search of a father figure, somebody who would take care of her and her mom. Simon gave her so much attention, and he said that he was a billionaire. The transition that Brittany made was parallel with the transition that Sharon made, from a very focused, caring, strong mom to someone who seemed hypnotized. We all were scared and freaked out, like, who? was this guy and what was happening. Simon had owed a man named Harley Pasternak money for personal training expenses. Lady Gaga, Ariana Grande, and Katy Perry, the man behind these beautiful bodies, celebrity trainer and nutritionist Harley Pasternak. But what does it take to eat and work out like Harley's celebrity clients? It's about these small habits. It's about walking more, sleeping better, managing their stress, eating better. Soon after seeing Brittany, he was suddenly able to pay up and began bringing her in. Not for personal training, though. I am a celebrity fitness and nutrition author. I trained Simon Monjack a number of years ago. First time I met Simon, he rolled up in a vintage Ferrari, and he got out smoking these fancy Cohiba cigars, and his girlfriend had the biggest diamond ring you've ever seen. They got engaged the night before, and she was happy, and then he said, we're both gonna work with you. And then his balance started to run up a lot more, and I wouldn't let him book new sessions. And then he called me one day and he says, hey, uh, I'm dating Brittany Murphy now, and I want to bring her in and for us to work out together and I'll pay you what I owe you. And they showed up one day. Brittany was for sure under the influence of something. Pills, maybe. She was kind of slurring her words. She was very sweet and, and, and kind of all over the place. And he said, Brittany's got a big project and I, I want you to get her ready for the role. Which is interesting considering she was already a very accomplished actress on her own, and she had no major or complex upcoming roles. In fact, after meeting Simon, she was unable to secure anything more than a B-movie and straight-to-video release roles. Okay, well, if I'm gonna work with Brittany, I'll just deal with her team. And I remember reaching out to her team and saying, she fired all of us. Simon is her agent, manager, and lawyer and everything now. You have to go through Simon. And they said, we're concerned because no one can contact her directly. You can only go through Simon. I don't even know if she had a phone. Simon was the only one who carried the phone. She seemed like she wanted to be with him? She just seemed like she was high. The other day, we overviewed a tweet that Kanye West shared with the world on social media. It was allegedly from his fitness instructor, Harley Pasternak. The text message itself seemed to have some threatening undertones, of which, if this indeed did come from Harley Pasternak, it alluded that Kanye had two options. Number one, that they would sit down and have a conversation, of course, with added stipulations attached to that option, or number two, that he would have Kanye West institutionalized and medicated out his mind and mentioned the extent to zombie land. This was eye-opening for many people not assiduous to what we have been observing about the public figures of our world. Harley P has been revealed to have a bit more of a questionable past, in spite of the connections he has now and being revered among celebrities. Kanye West, right before Aaron Carter's mysterious death in early November of 2022, had revealed that Harley P was more like a handler slash manager than any kind of personal trainer or life coach. He showed the threatening messages he was sent by Harley, trying to force him to comply with his team's wishes. 
He makes a very outward claim that this is how they control celebrities in the industry, and that they will use their children, their career, everything against them if they choose to go against the grain. Is Kanye West okay, or what happened here? So you can reach his publicists. And as far as we know, West remains hospitalized and is reportedly under a psychiatric evaluation. Meanwhile, there have been signs of trouble over the last few days that this just wasn't Kanye being Kanye. Here's a timeline. On Saturday, the 19th, during the Sacramento stop of the St. Pablo tour, he performed only a few songs, then went on this wild rant, even mentioning Jay-Z and Beyonce. Beyonce, I was hurt. Because I heard that you said you wouldn't perform unless you won video of the year over me and over how It didn't end there. On Sunday, the 20th, Kanye did something bizarre. Would you mind so we could just diffuse this and, you know, just a quick statement. Is, is he good? Thumbs up. During a workout or? You know, it's fans are going to be worried. Should we check in? Thank you. Thank you. Some sources had claimed that it did seem like she was under the influence in the months leading up to her death, seeming very floaty, happy and polite, but very forgetful, and requiring a lot of coaxing and prompting, having her lines repeated to her numerous times, just to get through each take. And sure, weed exists. Not every Hollywood celebrity does designer drugs. Some prefer the natural route, and it was and still is very popular in California. But there's no way it could have been a cause of death unless by some silly circumstances created as a result of being too stoned. A number of Simon's behaviors are consistent with narcissism and psychopathy. The excessive deception, particularly of a grandiose nature, his manipulative, controlling, demanding, and possessive behavior, his claiming to have cancer to get his way, his criminal history, and of course his excessive drug and alcohol use. Simon was a dangerous romantic partner regardless of who he was with, but Brittany Murphy appeared to be particularly vulnerable. Around the time they became a couple, Brittany was losing weight and probably using drugs. After she was with Simon, she lost more weight and used more drugs. Simon was able to take control of Brittany. They spent a lot of time in Brittany's residence. They hardly went out at all. She became more isolated from her friends and colleagues. Eventually, Brittany did not even have a cell phone and there were no landlines in her residence. Her friends attempted to intervene on at least one occasion, but Brittany would have none of it. She insisted Simon was good for her. Brittany became increasingly paranoid, worried about the paparazzi, for example, in part because of Simon's warnings. Simon was functioning as her business manager, agent, and even her makeup artist. He had a lot of interest in Brittany's money. He spent $3 million that belonged to her during their relationship, he bought fake jewelry and pretended it was real, like it was some type of investment. It seems likely he was doing this so he could have some type of explanation as to where the money was spent. So he was buying this cheap jewelry, saying it was expensive, and probably doing something else with that money. When Brittany was working on the movie Across the Hall, the quality of her work had diminished greatly. She was late for work, appeared to be out of it, like in a fog. Simon would hang around on the set. Brittany seemed to be in a good mood before she talked to Simon, but then after spending time with him, she was in a bad mood. At one point, Brittany told the director that she would not act intimate with another actor, only with her husband. They had a magical relationship. After the director allowed Simon to overhear that Brittany could be fired, Simon decided the relationship wasn't so magical and Brittany could follow the script. From this point, Brittany's condition only grew more serious. Just 
Did you hear what I just said? Yes. Huh? I think you watch too many movies. This house is creepy. It's an old house, Allie. Of course it's creepy. I've had the good fortune of being able to uh, play characters that are stuck in the middle of comedic situations, comedic stories, ridiculous, or 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 tragic. And um, I, I, it all has to do with the story and the director, and that, that that's really where the decisions are, are made on my behalf. You are gorgeous. Thank you, you so are. much. I Thank it. you. <laughs> Can I have your hair in my next life, please? <laughs> oh my God, are you kidding me? You're no. <laughs> God bless Should you. Should I be you in my next life? <laughs> no problem. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank have you. a nice day. So, it definitely seems like during the final year of her life, she was under the influence of something. But what? And was she even aware? Is it possible she was being dosed? And for what reason? perhaps to ensure obedience and complacency? There was a lot more to unpack here than I had initially thought, and it gets a whole lot darker, so make sure to subscribe and click that little bell, and hit that thumbs up while you're at it to show your support. Thanks for watching, and enjoy the rest of your day.